Good evening, everyone from Malta. I am a friend, Moise, and welcome back to SHIO. If you have been following us for a while, if not, uh, do click like and subscribe so you can be notified of all of our broadcasts coming up. Um, today, I uh, am going to have a chat with Nikki Gauder on the uh, financial services sector in Malta. And together, we're going to look at the challenges and opportunities of the local ecosystem and how the future might look, at, look like for us. Um, Nikki is the founding partner of Seed Consultancy in Malta, and he specializes in advising clients on taxation and corporate matters. Um, if you would like to get in touch with Nikki, um, his uh, details are rolling down the screen there, so just take note of it if you want to discuss further with him. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Nikki. Nikki, good evening and welcome. How are you? Hi, Fran. Good evening. Thanks for having me. I'm good. Thanks yourself. I'm great, and uh, thank you for joining us, Nikki. Now, before we kick off, I noticed that today is the first year anniversary of Seed Consultancy. Yeah. So, uh, happy anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an interesting 12 months. <laughs> That's all I want to ask. How was your first, uh, m uh, first year in business? Well, it's been, I mean, it's been interesting. So, I think any new startup has a very interesting and eventful, I would say, 12 months or possibly even more. Um, to add on to that, a global pandemic, which is which has created one of the greatest economic recessions we have seen, obviously has made it, for lack of a better word, more interesting. I think it has been challenging, like any st starting any new business would. But again, with challenges come as well um, uh, certain achievements. So we're happy where we are at today. We have a long road as to where we want to get to, but we're very happy as to what we achieved in the first 12 months of SEED. That's, that's great. That's great to hear, Nikki. And like you said, uh, with every challenge comes an opportunity. And, um, you know, you, when you start afresh um, amidst a global pandemic as well, you have a unique opportunity to reinvent yourself as well. Um, that sometimes when times are, are flowing and the economy is, is very, very strong, it's, it's can become difficult to differentiate yourself. So sometimes, you know, like you said, to look on the on the bright side yeah. of things. Well, we've got a long uh, a long talk uh, ahead of us, I think, when we talk about the the financial services industry. And uh, I like to kick off the discussion here with um, just a brief mention. I've, I ran a survey the other day on LinkedIn. Um, it wasn't, you know, a huge number of participants, around ninety six votes, but they're all. They were all quite specific in terms of financial services professionals in Malta from a variety of, um, of practices such as payment, uh, banking, and so on and so forth. And the question was, what is the biggest challenge that the um, local financial services industry is experiencing? And the results were quite, um, quite interesting. 57% uh, more than half consider reputation to be the biggest challenge followed by 23% who consider access to qualified staff a challenge and 20% find challenging implementing new regulations, which echoes the focus group that was conducted about a month ago in the financial services sector in Malta. And um, that, that was a much broader study. A lot more businesses were involved and professionals, but the results are, are fairly similar. The challenges identified have been reputational challenges, regulatory and compliance impact, bureaucracy, and the overall EU stance on the local taxation system. Um, I'll give you a moment to digest all of that. And, and what, what is your take on this as, a, as, as an experienced professional and, and a business owner as well? So I think it's uh, looking at the, the good side of things that only 20% see implementation of new regulation as the biggest challenge. Um, because I think even looking at it from a, a purely tax point of view, um, but not only, we've been hit and will continue to be with new regulations coming out from a tax point of view, AML, CSP and all of that. Obviously, it's worrying. Uh, the reputation issues are worrying. Any industry needs to have um, uh, its proper level of reputation, more so us in the financial services industry. I think, having said that, as a country in the last few months, we are heading in the right direction. I also think, however, on this matter, that reputation, we sometimes speak about reputation. 
as though this is something which is simply up to um, governments or other stakeholders or other authorities. Whilst they play a very important and key role, I think us as professionals also play a very, very important role when it comes to the reputation of the island. So the way we deal with clients, local, international, um, the solutions we offer them, the honesty when sometimes Malta is not the right solution and we shouldn't try to sell them Malta when Malta might not work, I think us as professionals also have an important role to play in improving Malta's reputation. As I said, government, authorities, and other similar stakeholders are, are vital that they help to improve our reputation. And as I said, I think we are on the right track. I think there's a lot, a lot left to be done to get our reputation to where it really should be. Um, but this is something where all the industry, I think, agrees that everybody should come together because without that, I mean, we lose a vital part uh, of the financial services industry, which, as you know, is... I would say together with tourism, um, the top industry in terms of contributor to GDP on the island. Absolutely, Nikki. I completely agree. And I believe that a lot of professionals are in a sentiment uh, with your comment that reputation is twofold. It comes at a macro level, uh, which is the regulatory institutions, the government, the legislation and implementation of it. But then it boils down to a micro level as well, which then looks at how we are implementing the regulations, but at the same time, how we advise our clients and the impact that we leave in the industry. I mean, what we've seen over, over the last Last uh, 24 months, I would I would go as far back to say that it has been um, a monumental effort uh, from the uh, regulatory side. Um, to overhaul and to improve the challenges that we have experienced, such as bureaucracy, for example, and the human resources element, because a lot of the delays that happened from a regulatory perspective also came from the lack of the human resources element as well. And we have made a uh, great, great stride. Um, and th there is still a long way to go, as you said. But as long as we have honest conversations and open conversations like this one, and we consult across the board with all the industry stakeholders and the regulated and, and the regulated entities as well, it will help us achieve the goal of um, continuing to grow the local ecosystem with businesses uh, and entities that enhance our reputation. In turn, I think as well what's important. Um, not just locally, but even when I look at things EU-wide, for example, I think it's important not to take it from one extreme to the other. Um, so I think as a country, we have and are doing a lot to improve our reputation by also including new regulations and new requirements on service providers, um, whether we're speaking about CSPs, accountants, tax advisors, and others. Um, but then we need to find the balance between the two in the sense compliance has become and will continue to become a cost, whether a cost from a, an actual financial cost or a, an administrative cost. Um, so even in terms of the market, in terms of service providers, I think we'll continue to see a shrinking of the market in terms of service providers because people will say or firms will say, listen, this, it doesn't make sense for me to continue to provide these services because the cost of compliance, whether from an administrative point of view or otherwise, is simply um, uh, too high. So I think we need to find a bit of a, a balance between the two. Um, ultimately, what we see as well, uh, as you know, my, my focus and my expertise are tax. So what we see as well from an international tax perspective, we have seen as well a lot of pressures and regulations coming from OECD, coming from the EU, and a number of changes which have happened in the last few years. And I would say possibly greater changes will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, uh, but there as well, so what we've seen is even in international structuring, international transactions, I think we've seen a reduction in such work because it's costlier. Why? Because there's a cost of compliance, there's a cost of substance, there's a cost to, to adhere to the rules. But then we've seen um, the bigger players, so more, more quality, I would say, and less quantity as it was a few years ago. And I think we will continue to go down that route. Obviously, um, as a jurisdiction, we do not have complete control of what we implement. So, for example, certain directives at EU level are automatically applicable here in Malta. Um, and that also affects 
the requirements of foreign direct investment coming into Malta and also requirements, as I mentioned, on service providers. Why? Because we need to up the bar um, and always adhere to these new regulations. And sorry if I, if, I, if I keep on going, but I think this has also led to an issue of being able to keep up to date. Um, again, looking at it purely from a tax point of view, the number of regulations and changes which come in, um, EU level, OECD guidelines from a domestic point of view. And again, people who are in a tax advisory business also have a business to run in the sense of the compliance issues, possibly a CSP. So being able to keep up to date is an investment in the staff, which is also an issue which you mentioned earlier. So this has a huge snowball of effect on the cost of providing services and then the quality of that services. I also think that firms will, there will be more focus. Um, why? Because it's impossible to keep up to date on every aspect of taxation, for example, unless you're a, a big four or it's impossible to keep up to date on every aspect of um, I don't know, AML. So there'll be more focus in firms providing more specialized services um, because of the limited resources and the limited available staff as you started off this this discussion yeah so so you think that we will start to see you know micro enterprises highly specialized very much boutique style in in their respective areas of practice that will be able to provide the advice and the guidance um to to, to possible clients um i think we'll see that so, so I, just, I think we'll see that and we'll also see, as we have been seeing, more mergers in the industry as well. Um, so smaller firms coming together to benefit from each other's resources and expertise. Why? Because going at it alone or with a team of two or three, it's very hard to manage all of this. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and this is a trend that I've, I've also started to notice, a lot more collaboration between um, boutique players in order to bridge that gap. Um, we've got a, a comment here uh, that says perhaps no discussion about the cost of compliance is complete without consideration of the cost of non-compliance, yeah. which is a very, very interesting point and one that I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, what, what are your thoughts on it, Nikki? Yes, no. There, so firstly, there is no doubt that the cost of non-compliance is um, uh, much larger than the cost of compliance. Um, and I think even, I think it's it's important to be compliant, also to be proud of what you do as a business and as a jurisdiction and also for reputational matters that we mentioned before. So for example, I don't believe that we should be compliant simply because the rules are need us to be compliant. That also links to the reputational matters that we discussed before. But yes, I completely agree with the comment. So, uh, one shouldn't one shouldn't say listen is it more costly to comply or to non-comply i think it is obviously clear that it would be much more costly to non-comply but in reality the problem is that a lot of firms either who have been used to doing business in a certain way and therefore this cost of compliance 10 15 years ago didn't exist or again uh, an issue for possibly startups or smaller firms where they need to have certain roles certain individuals in certain roles whether we're speaking about mlros compliance officers or others who because of the limited staff which is available on the island are not cheap um, so whether you're a firm of two people or a firm of 50 you need to have certain roles in that firm to be able to license to be able to be licensed under certain regulations for example so then businesses, particularly smaller businesses, will think twice before providing certain services which are licensable or even extending certain licenses. But yes, undoubtedly, um, the cost of non-compliance is much higher also, as we have been seeing as what has been happening um, in the news in the last few months. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that this is this is a sentiment echoed by by most of the professionals, if 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 not all, um, in Malta, is that there needs to be a balance between um, um, compliance, but also the cost of it. Now, personally, I've, I have always viewed compliance as the backbone of a business, because without it, I firmly believe that um, you know everything will crumble. Um, you know, it may work for one, two, three, four five ten years or whatever but there will come a point where it's not sustainable and then the repercussions of that both from a legal reputational and personal point of view can be disastrous so that's without a question um, but there it comes it 
becomes the balance, like you said, to look at the resources that we have as an island, especially from a human capital point of view, and how that can be balanced against the, the requirements. I think also what there needs to be is, um, even with regards to this issue of um, knowledge, I think whether the regulator, the authorities need to have, as they had today, to be fair, a number of webinars and training sessions so people can keep up to date and know what is expected from them. Um, because the reality is that whilst everybody has access to the law and access to understanding what there is, I think to be able to train people regularly not only helps in providing the training of what is required, but also helps in the mindset of the service providers and to always keep compliance at the forefront of everything they do. And that links back again to the reputation of us professional and as an island. So I think having regular training, which again, the MFSA and IFSP also do provide, I think that will help a number of service providers to say, yes, listen, there is the cost, but at least from a training point of view, I have access to this knowledge on a regular basis. That's that's a really good point, and it's in tandem with one of the comments that we've received as well, to some extent. Uh, it sounds like this. So would you agree that the sector needs a voice that projects its views, needs, and various efforts that goes beyond government bodies? Well, so I don't know if the question continued or that's it. No, 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 that's that's. That's well, I think I think there is there are there are various voices. So when we look at financial services practitioners, we look at IFSP, um, the accountants, there's the MIA. Um, from a taxation point of view, there's MIT, and um, these bodies do come together to make um, either together or even separately to make recommendations to the authorities. I mean, we see it from a tax point of view, but not only. So I think there are these voices. Possibly, uh, maybe not everybody is aware that as a member of the MIA or as a member of the IFSP, I can also make my recommendations directly. So I think those, those voices are there and I'm also a member on the tax committee of the IFSP. And these committees and also these bodies work very hard to make certain recommendations to the government and to authorities. Um, so I think those voices are there. I think people need to know that they have access to them um, and to make certain recommendations, which then do arrive also at the authorities. We also have to keep in mind one thing, however. So in the same way we speak about problem of staff within private sector, the public sector has the same issue. Um, so the public sector is has the same pool of resources available to it, which sometimes more limited budgets than private firms. So there could also be, and there are also problems in that case, where um, the public sector or certain government authorities do not have access to both um, the right amount of staff and also the, the number of resources required. So there we can also get certain bottlenecks both in terms of changes which we expect, but also in terms of processes of um, uh, certain applications or certain things which a few years ago used to be quicker. Uh, I mean, we always say sometimes we're a victim of our own success. And in some cases that is true. But when we speak about the problem of access to staff, it is not a problem simply of private firms, but as I mentioned, um, authorities also face the same issues and sometimes more because, as I said, of limited budget or salary caps which they have. Absolutely, and and this is this is a real challenge that the regulatory bodies have, um, and not only the regulatory bodies, but then we have you know the professional bodies like the um, IFSP and so on. Is that um, there are they have their own limitations, and but what would be the solution then? For example, because you know we are a population of just under half a million. Um, I, I believe it was it was the last country just just under. So obviously our geographical capacity as well as our numerical capacity is limited um, by um, by the fact that we are you know an island. You know I don't know if we can extend land any further than what we've already done so far. So then what would the solution be? Would perhaps you know a fast track visa for professionals? Um, or, or you know, uh, digital nomad visas. What, what could the solution look like? So I don't think that there are any easy solutions. So, for example, there are <clears throat> um, 
fast track visas, for example, for non-EU nationals applying for certain posts um, and within typically five to 10 working days, if they're within a certain role, within a certain salary bracket, they get quite a quick visa. For EU nationals, again, it's quite easy and straightforward. So I don't think it's simply a matter of importing knowledge because the processes are there. Um, I think possibly what we need to do as a country is also focus and have a clear vision in terms of what we want more to focus on both from a financial services industry but not only within the next 10 to 15 years for example so um, i think we sh we should say you know what the focus of more than the next 10 to 15 years in financial services for example should be um, focusing on Malta being a hub for the future of payments or open banking. In other industries, in terms of fo foreign direct investment, we should say, you know, our focus is going to be these particular industries. Having said that, I think before we do that, we also need to make sure that we have the right systems in place so that when foreign direct investment does come in, and it is coming in, the ease of doing business is there. So whether when dealing with the authorities, when registering a company, when opening a bank account, the ease of doing business is there. I'm not saying it is not there, but I don't think we are where we want to be there yet. Um, so the problem, I think, would be also um, something you mentioned earlier, the use of digital technology and, and AI. You know, we're a, we're a tiny country, and I think government authorities, and not only, can make use of AI and I would say particularly artificial intelligence because of these lack of resources. And we don't need that every paper that is sent to government authorities or other authorities is actually seen uh, by a human being. So I think in terms of this problem of access to resources, I think if we want to import knowledge from outside Malta, whether from the EU or, or non-EU, I think the processes are there. But I think as for the future, it has to be an investment in artificial intelligence for certain processes with government authorities and other, which reduce the, the need to have the number of resources in terms of human resources, and also to make it accelerate the process. So for example, um, if I'm applying for, the, for a grant, why, does, why is one of the requirements that I need to file with the government authorities my tax return? Shouldn't they have access directly to it? You know, so there's a lot of processes which we can simplify, I think, which makes the whole process simpler and makes us have less of a reliance on human resources because of the problem of finding uh, or access to staff, both in quality and also in quantity. That's a very interesting point, Nikki, and this, this particular topic with regards to um, a centralized system when it comes to the um, information that um, the government has about us, such as tax returns, ID numbers, and so on and so forth. I think the, the conversation took place, if I remember correctly, around two and a half years ago when um, Malta started to look uh, much closer to DLT blockchain technologies. And um, if, again, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Malta Chamber um, was one of the first institutions uh, to adopt a blockchain uh, technology. But um, I think we can definitely accelerate the adoption of such uh, to minimize um, the, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, but also minimize human error, which goes then hand in hand with the regulatory side. If we look at the compliance, so if we extrapolate this point of having to physically file and for someone to read every single piece of paper, if we extrapolate that to compliance and regulation, it is impossible for a, a compliance officer, for example, or an MLRO, you know, to know the ins and outs of you know client and keep files and everything. It becomes a very onerous role that um, reduces the lifespan that uh, a, an individual spends in that profession, essentially, which then contributes more to the skills gap as well. And this is something that I, I, I'm definitely um, in favor of uh, because it will also free a lot more human resources to focus on the advisory side that is necessary then, yeah. both from a regulatory and from a client perspective as well. Agreed. And I think um, uh, just one thing on this, I, I know the uh, MBR are also eventually going to launch, I believe, shortly a new portal in terms of registering companies, which will be a huge step in the right direction. I think, as you said, we're small. I think we can make huge changes. I think, unfortunately, in most countries, um, 
setting up a business sometimes is painful. And I think that is where we can have a competitive advantage on others because um, the impression we leave with foreign individuals when they come to invest in Malta, the initial impression counts a lot. And if that process is simplified and at the same time, we have less of a reliance on human resources, then I think it's a win-win for everyone. Absolutely. What What do you think, in, in your opinion, uh, Malta, no, I'm not sure delay is the right word for it, but what stops us from adopting this en masse, as it were? So the answer is I don't know, in the sense we're a very small country and I believe it's something which can be adopted quite quickly. I think maybe one of the problems is that dif- that the number of different authorities do things differently. So you have MFSA doing one thing, the tax authorities doing another, uh, FIU may be doing another, um, Malt Enterprise and Business Enhance may be doing things separately. Whereas when FDI is coming into the picture, um, they are typically in touch with most of um, these authorities. You have then the banks doing something completely separate. And again, I don't expect that the banks, MFSA and other authorities do things together, but I think from a government authority's point of view, this investment in AI and in improving processes, and again, as I mentioned, I understand the MBR is going through that, um, is something which will make life much, much easier. Banking then also, banking is something separate, obviously, because the government doesn't have any particular control there. Um, But the process of banking in Malta needs to be made easier. I also understand, to be fair, that banking worldwide and also in other European countries is also a pain point. So when we discuss with other clients or advisors in other jurisdictions, it's not like opening a bank account or dealing with banks is the most pleasurable or the easiest thing to do. It, to do. Uh, but I think there as well, um, when we look at the future of payments and what I believe, in my humble opinion, banks will look like in five to ten years' time, I think they will be very different. Um, to the traditional banks we know them today. And there again, Malta can have a competitive advantage. Why? Because we're small and we can make change very easily and very quickly. But we need to have the regulation and the legislation in place before um, we go out with certain um, uh, PR articles about uh, coming into Malta for, for particular reasons. Absolutely. Um, we, we have to get you know the infrastructure right from you know, the infrastructure in, in the broadest sense of the words, uh, and then go out to, to attract businesses. And uh, I, I, I remember that when I when I moved here to Malta eight years ago from London, I was amazed at the receptiveness of um, um, international uh, foreign direct investment to set up in Malta. I was absolutely amazed. I could not believe it, it was like a, a smaller London, if you will. Um, and we we have done uh, some 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 superb advancements and we have the capabilities um we have certain unique advantages that are not present in other jurisdictions that we can we can take um you know full full charge of and and with the right direction and with the right steering we can continue not only to um, cement the existing ecosystem but grow it even further and and you know streamline it and it now just occurred to me when you were saying earlier, Nikki, that you will see more and more boutique firms specializing in certain areas. You know, what you were saying now, it goes the same for Malta. You know, we should streamline yeah. our focus in what we want to specialize in, the type of businesses we want to attract and gear our efforts, you know, um, towards towards achieving that that goal. Yes, agreed. Because I think as a country, we have a lot to offer, even as professionals. Most clients who deal with professionals are always extremely happy, even when compared with other jurisdictions. So I think it's a matter of every com- everybody coming together um, for the good of the industry and the good of the jurisdiction. And again, um, I don't want to sound as though it's all doom and gloom, because it's absolutely not. You know, um, So we're doing a lot of things right. But I think with a little bit more, we can really have a competitive edge over a number of countries uh, over a number of European Union countries as well. Because we're ultimately, we're competing as a jurisdiction. So when clients decide to invest in Malta, they're making choices with other countries in the EU, with the US, with Asia. Um, so we're competing as a jurisdiction. And the ease of doing business, the compliance cost, the access to professionals, that is all taken into account when clients decide to choose Malta over other countries, apart from the tax issues and all of the other issues we yes, mentioned. Yes, 
absolutely that there are many many moving parts and um, limitations in terms of human resources, administrative costs, and the bureaucracy um, is going to significantly slow down business, but also cause, you know, the, the wind up of some existing businesses as well, because it will be impossible for them to sustain in the current climate. So like you said, you know, whilst we, we recognize the advantages, we have to also be very um, um, uh, frank about the, the challenges that, that we are facing um, and, and to work on those. Um, one of the things you've also mentioned, Nikki, uh, at the beginning and also now we, we, we touched slightly upon the tax perspective and, you know, the EU pressure with regards to, um, you know, a unified taxation regime. Um, what is the current situation like and how do you see the proposals being put forward affecting Malta? Okay, so we, we've seen in the last few years a number of changes. Um, so we had changes, uh, not changes relating, let's let's start with the direct tax changes more than the changes relating to transparency and exchange of information, because that happened slightly earlier. So we had seen the OECD push their agenda through, through BEPS, which is basically recommendations for countries um, uh, to reduce base erosion and shifting of profits from one jurisdiction to another. Um, after that, we have seen a, a response from the European Union, an introduction of the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, which again, they went beyond the BEPS project. Um, we also spoke about then ATAD2. Now we have discussions around um, digital tax and taxing the digital economy and recommendations from an OECD level in terms of two different pillars and also recommendations from an EU point of view. And at the same time, countries not wanting to wait for the OECD or EU come up with have introduced their own domestic changes. We're also seeing pressures now, and the US came on the bandwagon in terms of having a worldwide minimum corporate tax. Um, so I think there will be huge changes in the international tax scene as we know it in the coming months or years. I think having said that, however, the devil is in the detail. So one needs to understand as well, when we look at the proposals for digital tax, for example, what are the thresholds going to be? I know in one of the papers, it was mentioned that companies with um, turnovers of over 750 million will be affected by this um, uh, proposal or these recommendations. So then again, um, probably most, if not all Maltese companies or companies situated in Malta fall below that threshold, but possibly a few. So the idea, again, of the OECD, EU, or even the US is to look at the multinational enterprises. So particularly when we're looking at digital tax, the main aim is to look at taxing Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the apples of these words. But obviously, when you look into the detail, you, can, you have to be careful that other smaller um, players could also fall within um, these new rules. I think there's going to be an issue in terms of double taxation in the sense, as I mentioned, so certain countries have already introduced ways of taxing the digital economy in their own jurisdictions. Um, once we're going to have, hopefully at some point in time later this year, an OECD um, agreed approach, that needs to be either added on to what the countries already have, or possibly we have to wait for those countries to change. The EU are also looking at certain solutions from their end. So I think there are a lot of pressures coming, not, I would say, not pressures focused on Malta, but pressures focused on digital multinational enterprises. And as a result of that, obviously, certain companies in Malta could be affected by that as well. But like I said, the devil is in the detail, and one needs to see then once these proposals are approved and will eventually become um, legislations or directives, one needs to see how that is going to be imposed. There have also been discussions and also the ministry, uh, the minister mentioned it a few months ago of seeing how to change Malta's tax system. So again, in the last few years, we had some changes to our tax system from a domestic point of view. So for example, we had the introduction of a fiscal unit, which aimed to, one of the reasons was also aimed to solve the issue of the delays in our tax refund system. We had the introduction of the patent box regime. So we had a number of changes also from a domestic point of view. Um, I think there will also be 
changes in Malta's stack system, but one needs to see as well what is going to happen on the international front, whether from an EU or OECD level, both in terms of the dig digital tax or more so in terms of the discussion around corporate tax um, per se. And then we'll see how Malta will react to that in terms of um, uh, changes, changing our domestic legislation. Obviously, from a tax point of view, Malta is extremely competitive. Um, but clearly there again, I think we need to understand as a jurisdiction that whilst we need to remain competitive from a tax point of view because of our corporate tax rate and because of other benefits we, we give, whilst obviously being in line with definitely EU directives, but also OECD recommendations, I think we need to understand that um, our competitivity is not simply based on our corporate tax rate. So things we mentioned earlier, the ease of doing business, the ecosystems, the access to professionals, the access to, to staff, the infrastructure that we allow um, investment to work in. So tax simply has to be one of them. Um, it can't be the sole reason why companies come to Malta. And having said that, it is not. So a lot of the discussion we've had from an international tax perspective is the requirement for more and more substance, um, whether we're looking at operational companies, holding companies. So our tax rate has to remain competitive, but, and also because of the changes which will be coming along, um, we have to make sure that we remain competitive also from a non-tax perspective to be able to attract the investment. Therefore, everything we mentioned earlier in terms of the AI and focusing on specific industries has to remain there together with our tax competitivity. You've, um, you've also mentioned, uh, Nikki, that um, the issue of uh, the EU looking at you know, double taxation on the digital economy side and also the US looking at uh, you know, a, a, a uniform tax rate uh, proposal across the board. And whilst, as you've mentioned, a lot of, um, of perhaps you know, local businesses do not fall particularly within that category in terms of the threshold of the turnover, um, do you feel, though, that it might cause um, disengagement here locally within the financial services industry in the sense of, A, understanding of the, of the implementations and of the regulations, you know, in terms of understanding how it affects one, but will it also affect something that we've started to notice that has grown in Malta following the pandemic, which is the platform? and digital economy um, of, of workers and how we can um, tap into that, especially from a, a digital nomad startup perspective as well. Yes, look, I think one of the, um, uh, one of the issues is that one cannot really um, separate the digital economy from the rest of the economy um, because every economy or most industries have, have gone digital. Um, I think, yes, I think in terms of what you said also, for example, in terms of the digital tax proposals at OECD levels, um, there are certain complications also in how profit allocation will happen amongst countries. And that could get into a very, very, very complex situations, situation which could end up in double taxation and issues which might never be solved. Um, I think the discussion as well at US which which continued, I would say, from a US perspective in terms of having um, a unified global corporate tax rate, I think, unfortunately, will end up in a political game. Um, so most jurisdictions and jurisdictions which are not only more, but we look at Luxembourg, Ireland, Netherlands and Cyprus in the EU and there are others outside the EU, will obviously not be too keen on you on the recommendations being made at, U at the US level. But this ends up then being a political issue. So it could be something which could be very well implemented. Um, but yes, it could be that we see major changes. The problem is when we get to new tax rules, which are complex. So for example, the profit allocation, which is being discussed from a digital tax point of view, that leads to several issues, one of which is double taxation. Um, and what happens, unfortunately, is when there are complex issues, so there is uncertainty for investors, then that is one of the greatest problems for investment. So when one isn't 100% clear of how they are going to be taxed if they invest in a particular jurisdiction or start in a particular industry, then that's a big problem. I also think that looking at it also from a European Union level, um, uh, I think 
this whole issue of ease of doing business and all of that, which we're discussing for Malt, I think it is also something which we can put on at a European Union level. So I think the issue is, for example, last time I was listening to, a, I think it was an FT podcast where it mentioned a number of worldwide companies which are in the AI space and they're developing certain technologies. Six are in the US and three are in Asia. Um, and a number of the major startups we hear about in the digital space, but not only, typically are from the US or from Asia. And this is a problem. It clearly shows that the EU is doing something which is not right, either by not attracting um, the right startups or by pushing out businesses who want to do business in a correct way. It could be a, an issue of over-regulation. It could be a, an issue of going overboard, even from a tax point of view, in terms of the OECD recommendations. So I think the EU also needs to take a decision as to whether to keep on pushing for regulation in every aspect of the financial services industry to try and control even more or to understand that possibly it can even raise more revenues by being less aggressive on regulation. Why? Because you then are able to attract more businesses into the European Union. The fact that most of the success stories that we hear about in, about startups, whether in the digital space or others, are either in Asia or in the US, I think says a lot about what the EU is managing to do in terms of attracting business. And I think there needs to be a discussion as well around that forum in terms of what is the ultimate goal about, of the European Union and are we simply just trying to tax everything under the sun, even if it leads to double taxation. Um, I mean, today, like you said, it's very easy to be digital. So in reality, for certain companies, whether they operate from the EU, from Asia, from the US, it's not particularly complex, you know. Uh, so businesses move, businesses are very mobile, in, mobile individuals are too. So in the same way Malta needs to ensure that it is able to attract individuals to the country, the European Union needs to do the same. But isn't there a very, very fine line between um, um, regulation and non-regulation as well? Because it, or any measure that is introduced that disrupts the status quo is going to be perceived um, in, in an enhanced way than, uh, than in normal circumstances. Um, so it, it is a very fine line between the two. And like you said, it, it, it feeds into the reputational side of things. So how, how can we achieve that balance? I know this probably, you know, the $1 million question, you know, how do we achieve the balance? Um, if we look back in 2007, um, in, in the financial crisis, you know, there, 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 there came a wave of regulation that absolutely suffocated financial services to the point that the burden was put solely on financial services practitioners and zero onto the investor side of things, for example. And that created um, not, not, you know, so pleasant ripple effect that we, you know, have managed to, to overcome it, luckily. Otherwise, we have been disastrous, I think. Um, but how, how, how do we, you know, balance that out? Because we do need regulations, we do need control, and we need to ensure a trustworthy environment where the good actors flourish and the bad actors are quickly identified and removed from the system. Look, uh, just to be clear, I'm all for regulation. Regulation needs to definitely be there in the financial services industry and in other. I mean, we saw what happened with deregulation. You mentioned the 2007 financial crisis. One of the problems which started that is the massive deregulation which went on in the US banks. So regulation has to be there. I think there's then also a fine line between regulation and over-regulation. Um, so I think regulation needs to be there but at the same time being business friendly both on investment but also on the individuals giving providing the service and here again i'm not speaking at the level of malta only but also i'm speaking at the level of the european union so regulation definitely needs to be there um, the problem is when we go overboard with over regulation and when sometimes we try to introduce again not just as a jurisdiction but also as a union a one size fits all and whether we're speaking about an outfit of three individuals or whether we're speaking about a bank of 200 individuals, they are expected to have the same type of, I don't know, compliance requirements, for example. Again, yes. here I'm just giving an example. Um, so I'm all for regulation and that has to be there also because that links to what we mentioned earlier about reputation and doing things correctly. The problem which kills business is sometimes over-regulation. And I think... Um, 
at an EU level, that is happening far too much. Um, again, I'm not saying let's deregulate completely or let's deregulate, but I think we need to be careful of introducing too much regulation. I mean, we see it again, like I'm saying, from an e from a tax perspective, um, the number of new regulation which have been introduced, which the ultimate goal of them is ultimately um, fair. But one needs to also understand what impact that is having both on practitioners and also on investment. One also needs to understand, because ultimately, in, for example, from a tax point of view, the ultimate goal of introducing regulation is for countries or for the union to collect more revenue. One also needs to make a cost-benefit analysis of these regulations and how much more tax revenues are they leaving in the coffers compared to the cost of implementing those regulations, whether by the private sector or um, by the public sector as well. So yes, there's a very fine line between the two. We have to be careful of over-regulation, again, not just as a jurisdiction, but as I mentioned, as a continent too. And, and you've made a very, very interesting point uh, Nikki, that um, you know, a, a blanket approach to regulation, irrespective of the size of the firm um, and, and their capacity, is very dangerous because what happens then is that the smaller players are literally um, weeded out of the market, more or less, they are eliminated. And we will have these monopolies, essentially. Um, and we can see some example in the in the digital world, for example, of certain monopolies that have monopolized the market and have suffocated smaller players. And then it no longer becomes a free economy, does it? It, you know, becomes a, it's a very dangerous and just, um, game to play. <laughs> agree. And just one thing, one one aspect we shouldn't forget as a jurisdiction and also as the European Union is the UK. Um, so obviously today, every country has its own issues to deal with in terms of COVID. Um, but the UK are no longer being part of the European Union. Again, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying they're going to deregulate completely um, and they will not deregulate completely, but they're obviously freer to introduce or to um, uh, slow down on certain regulation to, 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 to continue to attract investment. One of the discussions, in fact, is um, uh, the regulation which they have in terms of financial services and how then an agreement between the EU and the UK will be reached in terms of passporting licenses from the UK. So let's not forget the UK is a big competitor of Malta, but also of the European Union. And once the pandemic is done, obviously more, uh, more countries will see how to attract investment. And the UK is freer to do so as a result of the leaving the European Union. Obviously, to be clear, I'm not advocating to leave the European Union. Absolutely not. Um, but one needs to be careful of overregulation. And, 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 and to balance it out, because like you said, there is competition across the board and we need to bear in mind uh, the burden um, and a, a cost and benefit analysis. It's, it's very, very important. Um, but also it comes, you know, with um, with the development of culture from an ethical perspective as well. I, I, I had a chat with someone many, many months ago uh, last year where we looked at you know a culture of compliance and it you know it goes to what you said at the beginning that us as professionals need to have that um, ethical um, backbone and that um, ethical approach towards things and when we do see something you know that is not um, done in the right way we can you know all come together and, and find a solution towards it as well. Agreed. And that's why all the industry needs to come together. And the authority obviously needs to make sure that everybody's following the rules, but also needs to continue to attack at um needs to continue to act as a support filter for service providers, you know. Um and having this culture of compliance, so even the regular training, it creates a culture of compliance in the country. So everybody's clear goal is to ensure that they are compliant whilst not going overboard as well because they also we compete obviously with other jurisdictions but yes coming together as an industry the authorities and the private sector will make life easier for everybody and then also more competitive because we'll know where we're going as a jurisdiction Absolutely. And uh, it's great to see that more webinars are taking place, you know, um, that bring information to the professionals. They explain the legislations and the rule because this only contributes to, to the benefit of, uh, of everyone. Sure. Yes, and, and, uh, well, and today it's even easier. Sorry, but today it's easier because I mean, we're used to these webinars. And this morning I can be on a webinar 
uh, with someone from Asia in the evening I can follow a webinar with someone from New York so access to information is there absolutely absolutely we had uh, we, we've we've opened many many eyes in the industry yeah. throughout the pandemic um, even in terms like you said access to training to to see you know that things can be done remotely but at the same time we've opened um, you know as a headhunter obviously human capital is, is a very strong area I mean it, it is my main area but it, you know it also has opened the possibility of companies to see a different way of working and this also gives them flexibility and it can reduce costs so rather than having an office for 300 people you have one for yeah. 100 for example and the rest yeah. work remotely so it brought about many many benefits um, we are nearing the end because I think we can, you know, talk about this until, until yes. tomorrow morning. We can dissect everything. But before we do that, there is one other comment um, that says that regulation introduced to protect consumers of financial services often ends up in dramatic consolidation and the reduction of options available for advice. Investment services is one prime example. I'm not sure I understand exactly uh, whether it was a co question or, or, or more of a comment. If yeah. you want, um, you know, Nikki's view on it, um, if you could rephrase it so we can address it properly, that that would be great. Otherwise, do feel free, you know, to follow up with with an email. We will uh, definitely get get back to you as well. Um, I, I, I've put you in hot water, Nick, you know, I said, ask Nikki definitely, no, don't ask fine. me, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, what, what, what I have a, an overall knowledge, you know, uh, you know yeah. ask me for, for <laughs> specific regulatory advice is not, it's not a good move. Uh, but uh, look, thank you everyone for, for joining us and Nikki, thank you very, thank very you for much. Thank you for having me, It was a pleasure. And like you said, the conversation could have gone on forever. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> And thank you for choosing, uh, you know, to spend your your evening with us. Um, this will uh, uh, this uh, recording will will be uh, available online. And now we have clarification that the person was supporting your point on over regulation. Thank you for clarifying <laughs> that, and 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 thank you for your for your comments as well. Um, I wish you all a, a lovely evening, and uh, stay safe and try not to go crazy. <laughs> stay safe. Thanks, Fran. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.